there's a lady there, she was, um, her lungs, she had a lung transplant, and she, um, it wasn't working. So she could hardly breathe, has a lot of difficulty breathing. She couldn't even get up and go to the bathroom, she said, without a lot of difficulty because her lungs just were not functioning. And uh, so we went there and just ministered to her, just laid hands and just, God, you know, just, she was in a lot of pain as well. And so the pain was just draining away and uh, she could start breathing deeply again and she was um, much happier <laughs> as a result. <laughs> so, I mean, we just see God all the time doing things, but it's, I mean, He is so real. I mean, a lot of people think, I'm waiting on God to do something. No, God's waiting on us to believe Him. You know, sometimes we can be, um, even in worship or prayer or ministering, healing, or whatever we're doing, we can be like viewing God somewhere, and we are here. And we're trying to get God to move. <laughs> that is the common thought process of, of most uh, Christians when they're praying or something. But instead, we need to understand that God is in us. If we are believers, He is, has enjoined Himself to us. And it's no longer about God. God, would you please come? He, he already came, and His name is Jesus. And He came, and He did what He did, so that when we receive Him, His very Spirit comes into our life and transforms us. And we become an embodiment of the kingdom of God. Today I actually want to talk about, you know, the, the, the kingdom of God, the treasure of the kingdom of God in the sense of the real Christian life, what that actually means, you know, and I, and I want to look at that. But if we understand what it means to have, to be the body of Christ, uh, the embodiment of God, okay, we are not God, okay, I, I hope, you know, by now you realize that's not what I'm saying, <laughs> but, you know, the gospel is all about Jesus living us. And Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That God hopes in us that we will let him manifest. That his life, that we will believe in him to the point of action so that he can manifest himself. So that he can change people's lives, beginning with our own. So we, so we need to, sometimes I just find myself, even though I know this, you know, sometimes I find myself, you know, in ministering or, or even just, work, or it doesn't matter what I'm doing, with praying or, or whatever, where I consciously just make sure that I'm not making that separation. You know, some songs we can sing like, um, God, please come, and, and something like that, but he, he, He's already here, or, you know, I want more of you. Okay, I understand that to a point. You know, if we understand that He has given Himself completely to us, um, but it's up to us to get in tune with Him, you know, through our faith, our belief, through our accepting what He has done. So basically, it is that maturation process in ourself. It's not that we are waiting for God, we want more of Him because He's holding back, He's only given us a little bit of Himself and, and we want more. <laughs> no, with Jesus, He's given Himself in His entirety to us. He, he has enjoined Himself to us. But now, if we you know, if we just realize that, okay, to, what does it mean in Ephesians 4 to grow up into Christ in all things? It's not that God needs to do something more. It's that we need to believe in Him whom He has sent and in what He has done so that we can fully live and experience and access all of, God, all of who God is. So in that sense, you know, because sometimes, you know, we'll uh, sing a song or something and if you see a song here and it says that, let me turn this off. God is always broadcasting. What do you mean no signal? <laughs> you see, that's what I mean. The TV is not in the spirit. <laughs> no. So, um, well, I lost my train of thought there. Anyway, so the point is that if you see a song here, because, uh, you know, we kind of try to filter out those that are saying, you know, God, we want you to come because he's already come, you know. But sometimes there's a nice song and there's just one word in there, but we just need to understand it properly. If we understand... It's the difference between a spiritual gift and walking in maturity, actually. If, and you know, I'm not going to talk necessarily about spiritual gifts today or whatever, but so I hope I don't raise more questions by this, but a gift 
if we're if if we are di the difference between walking in a gift and walking in the fullness of Christ in maturity is kind of like in a gift there's an external force or an external something which kind of you realize and it kicks in and so now you're doing things a little bit differently according to that gift and and you know it's working you know it's from God it's good but spiritual maturity is your paradigm that you live in all the time your awareness of God your faith in him your spiritual senses having been used and exercised so that you are expecting God to do whatever needs to be done in that situation and no longer is it an external thing you're trying to get to happen or an external thing you're trying to tune into and become aware of but it's a part of you and your paradigm so so that's so God gives his gifts and he want but the goal if we read in Ephesians 4 is to bring us to maturity in the fullness of Christ which means uh, all of the aspects of the Spirit of God at work in our life and we're flowing with him we're walking with him in unity and if Jesus is with the woman by the well and 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 a word of you know knowledge and wisdom and and all of this needs to come through Jesus Jesus just flowed flowed flew flowed <laughs> he was just um, expecting always walking in relationship with his heavenly father and he was not looking for an external thing to happen but he was he knew that everything that he needed to minister to this woman effectively and everything is in relationship with his father and and it, it was there you know because he expected um, that and so we need to um, I to say we, we sometimes back to what I was saying sometimes I find myself just um, making sure that I'm not making the separation if I'm if we need to go into the hospital and minister healing to somebody or whatever the case may be we cannot think of it as you know God will you please because he's put the ball squarely in our court you know and he said you go and heal the sick you go and change the world you go and preach the gospel you go and make disciples you go I've given you my entire spirit all of me I'm not holding back I'm not giving you a little bit of me all of me is contained in Jesus and so we need to not make that distinction but um, it's like if God is here and we are here and, and not thinking of okay we need some interaction here but but just realizing it's it's you know like the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened that we may know the hope of our calling that we may know Christ and so that his power may be at work in us in full measure so we need to through our just realizing what Christ has done that he has enjoined us to him to the believer you know and so that we can approach every situation in faith you know and we can approach every situation with the assurance and boldness that Jesus we are the body of Christ you if you're a believer you are the body of Christ it is not you're not waiting on God for he has if you're his body then when you lay your hands that's God's hands you see we need to walk with this mindset we need to walk with this assurance of understanding um, John Lake was um, just a second here Need a bigger stand I for, for me I might have mentioned this once or twice but um, I used to my mom used to drag me to church okay when I was young <laughs> and uh, didn't really when I got old enough to, to say so I said okay I'm not going anymore <laughs> it's boring <laughs> I didn't like it <laughs> um, but um, because I looked around and I saw people's lives and I was like you know their lives don't look any different than the people who don't go to church or anything so you know like why so obviously to me that meant there was no difference you know and I you know I figured that if there was something really different then it would make people live differently you know and indeed that's the way it is so you know I um, 
John Lake was uh, here in South Africa, and um, he there was a time when um, they needed to uh, the mines needed to bring in people from other places to be able to work the mines. There were some situations going on, so they needed to do that. And so some Chinese people came in. So people from different cultures and countries came into the country. And that the government at the time then brought in their priests and their, uh, you know, people so that they had a whole cultural um, thing going on there. They had their pastors, they had their priests, whatever the case may be. So the end of that was that all these different world religions were represented here in Johannesburg. And, you know, so John Lake was here, who, and he saw it as an opportunity to get all these religious leaders together from these various um, world religions and, you know, see if they can't dialogue and sit down and just discuss. And they all say, okay, this is what we believe and this is what we believe. And just bring them all there and just have free, you know, not with micro, just sitting around and everybody together just sharing, you know, to, to see just to see what would happen, you know. And so he was able to organize that, and they did this. And um, everybody was, it got to a point where then everybody felt comfortable to just honestly share this is what, and he walked away from that experience with a renewed, with a much greater appreciation for what he had in Christ. Um, because he, you know, as I've said before, there's really only two religions in the world. One category of religion is the do-it-yourself. You have to achieve this, do this, work for this, and then you will achieve whatever the goal may be. So you can categorize it as a do-it-yourself religion. And the other one is God reaches down and said, hey, you know what? You guys could never build a ladder to reach up to me by your good works or whatever it is. And so here, I'm, gonna, I'm going to initiate the link of relationship here. And I'm going to do what it would be impossible for you to do to try to, you know, build a ladder to me. So I'm going to reach down and I'm going to die for you, you know, because God is light and perfect. And how can we have fellowship with a perfect God unless he initiates it and brings us into himself? So Jesus came, he paid the price. He, he, you know, he gave his life so that our sins and all those bad things wouldn't be counted against us so that we could enter into relationship with him. So when he did that, and then we have faith and we receive this free gift, what Jesus accomplished, then God brings us into himself. So one is the do-it-yourself category, and the other one is God reaching down and bringing us into relationship. And so um, John Lake walked away from that, those meetings just with a, he said, you know, in varying degrees, you know, everybody has some light, some some bit of truth, some, you know, whatever. But the fullness, the, 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 f Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. So God himself is the embodiment of truth. Truth is not a system of belief. Truth is not a man-made list of religious codes of conduct, of theological doctrines. That, that's not true. Truth is God himself the creator who created us, he is truth. Okay, so when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, what he was saying is, the truth is me, God. Okay, so if you want to receive truth and walk in the fullness of truth, you have to receive me <laughs> and walk with me and then you will embody truth. And so only Christianity, only relationship with Jesus can bring us into that full experiential relationship with truth himself, which is God. And so just Lake walked away from those meetings just with that. Assure, even if, I mean, he was sure before, but even a, high, a heightened level of assurance that, man, there is nothing like a relationship with Jesus. There is nothing like Christianity. I don't even like using that word sometimes because it sounds like a religion, but it's, it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship with truth himself, who is God. Um, so what... I, I, like I said, I want to talk about the real Christian life, God's, you know, and the kingdom of God, embodying the kingdom of God, what, because that is, the, that is the Christian's destiny. You know, it's not to be a, a religious person, and it's not to be a follower of another moral code. It, it, it is to walk with God himself in relationship and with, to embody the kingdom of God. 
because that's what Jesus did. And so, you know, what does that look like? There was a man, um, John Lake, you're all familiar with, but John Lake actually learned a lot of the walking in the authority and the power of God and divine healing and all, and all of that from a man named John Alexander Dowie. And it's safe to say, Curry also talks about this, that since John Alexander Dowie is probably the one that we can point to right now and say in our you know, time period that um, there wasn't another person that embodied in this recent times what the, uh, God's intention is as far as a man walking in, in the embodiment of the kingdom of God, as far as walking in his authority and his power, in his, like Jesus, okay? And um, now he kind of got off track in the end, so just a disclaimer, I'm not lifting up Dowie here or anything like that. But he did understand what it meant to walk in the, in, in the, as a representative of the kingdom of heaven. That's who a believer is, is a representative of the kingdom of God, the one who created the universe. Because people are looking for truth. Like I said, I was, you know, looking for truth way back when. I said I went to various churches and stuff and I didn't find it. But if I would have seen an embodiment of the kingdom of God like that, 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 that would have gone a long way to kind of make me feel like, let me take notice. What's, what's that person saying? What, you know, what's happening here? So people who are looking for truth are not going to find it in doctrines or in uh, codes of conduct and religious rules and all of these things. Truth is God. And God needs an embodiment. Remember, believers are called the body of Christ in Scripture, right? So truth, God needs to be embodied for people to see the truth, okay? So yes, it's important to have proper doctrine and be able to explain things and why things work and, and have a clear doctrinal foundation of truth for, that we get from Scripture, absolutely. I'm all for that, you know that. But more than knowing of truth, God's intention is that we embody truth. Okay, God is not impressed with our, um, if we can recite things that are true with our mouth. Okay, we can be together here, study amazing truths, talk about amazing truths from the Word of God, and we can repeat it to people. We can know all the right things to say. We can... Um, you do all these things, but until we live like Jesus, Jesus is, is an embodiment of truth. Jesus said, if you have seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father. Because he was saying, show us the Father. That, it, that, that'll be enough for us. Just show us the Father. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you, Philip, that you don't know me? If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. That is what God's will is for our lives. That when somebody looks at your or my life, they will see God. They will see and hear, they will hear, of course, truth coming from our lips, but they will see the manifestation of the love, the mercy, the power, the authority, the character, the nature of God coming through our lives and changing situations, healing the sick, uh, consoling those who need encouragement, wh whatever the case may be, whatever love dictates in that situation. People need to see and taste and see that God is good. That is God's intention. Okay? So we will never... We will be... Um, let me put it this way. We will never reach our full effectiveness as far as God intends with words alone. The world is full of words. How can somebody who's seeking truth know which words are the words to, okay, the Holy Spirit does speak to people's hearts if they are sensitive and, and they can detect that this is truth. But there's a lot of people that they're not sensitive <laughs> to 
uh, God and their conscience. And maybe their conscience is even seared because they are whatever their case may be. So they've, they're far away. What do you do, you know, in those situations? Those people need a clear and powerful demonstration of the kingdom of God. They need an embodiment of God himself. They need the body of Christ to demonstrate to them what God is like, what he is capable of doing, what is his heart, his nature. He's not that mean person with a stick just waiting to beat people who don't do... No, no, no. He is love. God is love. And what would love do when there is somebody who needs healing? Love would heal. What would love do if somebody is in need? They would meet that need. You know, God is all-powerful. All and we talk about that, but we need to live. We need to stop making the distinction, God is there and I am here. This is the power of what Christ has accomplished. He's done this with those who receive and believe in Jesus Christ and make Him Lord and Savior. This is the relationship we have with Him. So when God wants to do something, it's together. The scripture says we are co-laborers with Christ, with God. There is no, God doesn't see. When the devil is looking at us, he doesn't see us. <laughs> because Jesus so, because we're, our life is hid in Christ, the scripture tells us. And when we walk with that full understanding and faith and trust in God, in that kind of relationship, when, when we're coming, the devil doesn't see us. He sees Jesus, Christ in us and through us. And so that is why we can be effective. Uh, that's God's intentions. Anyway, for our life. John Alexander Dowie was a, uh, he, he understood. Um, he's where John G. Lake actually learned about divine healing and all of these things. And um, he, Dowie was um, the trolley cars. So what do you call those uh, here? I don't know if I'm using the right word. You know, those little cable cars, the, the, the like buses on electrical tracks, trams, whatever. I don't know what the South African term is. <laughs> anyway, they, Dow, when Dowie would have his meetings, so, uh, so many people would come and, and the effect was so that the city would adjust their timetables uh, so that to accommodate the people. Um, the, the Dowie was speaking um, and dictating what would happen at governmental levels and, and things, the city actually revolved around what he was saying and the things that they would do because they were walking in such authority and demonstration of the Spirit of God that people saw truth and they would come and it would just, so many people would come and the effect was so great. I mean, he eventually started a city, Zion, Illinois. and Okay, and that, okay so then he had a little... Um, yeah, he kind of got off a little bit in the end. But believers, that is what we are called to do. We are called to make such an impact in the society in which we live where God's power, truth, and goodness, and which has practical landing gear of effects in the community and projects that we do is so obvious and so supernatural that people will take notice and just realize this is truth. Well, whatever those guys, I don't know who they are, but I'm going to go there and find out what, what, <laughs> what's being said there because they can see and they can experience God. You know? And that is um, what God has for us. I mean, if you think about it, what can make Peter, who denied Jesus three times, and then in a matter of just you know, a few days, be willing to speak out boldly. Okay, so first, you know, people coming, hey, weren't you with Jesus? And he was, no, no, I wasn't, no, and he was cowering and, and, you know, afraid. What can make then a few days later, Peter standing up before thousands of people declaring the kingdom of God and what Jesus accomplished with such power and authority that he wasn't scared about when they would come to take him and the religious people, leaders would beat him and all this and say, stop doing that. And what, what, what caused that transformation there? Because Peter was not like that.
What can cause, okay, this was just, um, there's a website called Voice of the Martyrs, and this was just a very recent one of a few days ago. In Mexico, in 2014, there's a woman named uh, Eugenia. She had a 12-year-old son. Their house was burnt down because they were preaching the gospel. They were persecuted, but they, you know, she just kept on preaching the gospel, and eventually somebody came in. It was actually a 15-year-old boy, came in and so you must stop preaching and with a machete and just was hacking at her, you know. And um, she was saying, okay, Lord, if, if it's my time to go, I go with pleasure. But uh, she said, what did she say? She said, um, if it's my time, I'll go. But, he, but she said, but if it's not, I don't want to. So into your hands I commit my spirit at that moment when she was getting attacked. And so she... In a way, she realized, hey, you, you, my spirit is in your hands. And so into your hands, I commit my spirit. At that moment, the attacker froze and left. So she didn't die. So she still committed to reaching the people and reaching out, and she didn't stop. What causes somebody to live like that? This is not about an ideology. This is not about a moral code, a, a system of beliefs. This is about a relationship. This is about something which Eugenia, this is something that Peter, and just to name a couple, I mean, this is, they had something that overrided everything that people normally in this world hold dear and caused them to live in such a way that is totally unlike normal people live, okay? Their relationship with God, there was a part of them, that innermost being, that was given entirely to God. And they found joy in that relationship. They found truth in whom He is. And nothing or no one can change that. I mean, if you know, and you are in the midst of love Himself, and you are in the midst of the embodiment of God Himself, who is truth, and, and you love truth, and you love God. I mean, what can anybody do to you to, to dissuade you from living for God and helping other people know Him? What is life all about? I mean, if we realize life is not all about the material things, life is not all about positioning ourself in, you know, God cares for us. You know, he said, seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added to us. But it's not about all those things. <laughs> it's about God himself. And when we finally get it, when we finally realize that this life is not about ourselves, but this life is about the giver of life and living in him and with him, because only in living in him and with him can we partake of the meaning of life, the joy of life? Only in, in this relationship with Him can we manifest true love, can we understand true love, can we truly help people effectively as God intends. So only in that relationship, so if, if we love God and we love truth and above all else, that is the door, the entrance door to the kingdom of God. Where we, be, where we begin to understand what motivated and drove Jesus, what motivated and drove the Apostle Peter, what motivated and drove Eugenia, what motivated anybody who lives like that. So we are talking a whole lot more than just, you know, uh, a teaching on walking in the power of God or, you know, um, anything else. In fact... Um, it says um, in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus is making a distinction here. Some people call him Lord. <laughs> Lord, I love you. And then trouble comes or persecution comes and they're like, uh, where do I exit from here? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's not love. Would love, if you love your, your child, you love somebody, 
would you leave them in the face of danger? Would you leave them? Or would you stand there and say, no, I'm staying with you. And I'm going to, you know. So it's like, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, the proof of true faith is in our actions. It's in how we live. It's in what we do. It's not in what we say. It's not in what we say we believe or any of that. It's in how we live. It's in what we embody. Jesus is called the Word of God made flesh. The living Word of God. He is God Himself. It says in John 1, and he's, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. The Word of God became flesh. We, God's intention for every believer is that we will be the Word of God made flesh. His will, His word, His love, His character, His nature, His power, His authority, all that He is, His desire is to manifest Himself through us. And He's not, the fullness of God cannot be manifested through a person whose mind is on themselves all the time, in the flesh, I'm saying. That is incompatible with life in Christ. If we talk about being baptized in the fullness of the Spirit and all this, this aspect, walking in the, in the fullness of Christ, we cannot walk full of... I, if I have a cup of liquid, it's full. If I try to pour other liquid on top, it's, it's going to you know, dribble off and stuff. We need to get rid of the old so that we can receive whom God is. You know? A self-centered life is incompatible with the kingdom of God because God's kingdom is not founded on self-centeredness. The kingdom of God is founded on love. The kingdom of God is caring about your neighbor as yourself. The kingdom of the God's motivations and hearts and is, is all about, I will come and die for you. That's what he did. That's what God did for us. That's what Jesus did. He said, you're in such a state that you cannot help yourself. You're in such a state that the only way out is me giving my very life for you. He did it. Jesus did it. And he came down and he gave it all. That's why he can now turn around and said, walk with me. It, it'll be a beautiful relationship, but it, it means laying down the old. You, you have to leave the old behind. The scripture talks about old wineskins and new wineskins. If you have, it says, Jesus said that you cannot put new wine into old wineskins because those old wineskins will burst because new wine will expand. Um, and if, if that's an old wineskin, then it's already been expanded. And so now you're putting new wine, which needs to expand, into old wineskins, which have already expanded to their limit, and they're not going to expand anymore. So you put that new wine in there, and, and the wineskins will break, and the wine will be lost. So Jesus, he, he, his new wine, him, God is ever, God is not contained. <laughs> okay, he is unlimited. So if we want to walk in him, we always have to be a, a new wineskin, so to speak. We always have to be willing to stretch beyond our current paradigm of understanding, our current paradigm of the way we do things, the current paradigm of this is what I'm comfortable with. God can't pour his new wine into that wineskin. He needs people. He needs us to be those who say, I'm willing, Jesus, to live and walk with you however you want that to look like. I'm willing to, to walk with you because all I know is I love you. You are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. And there is nothing more important. There's no one more important than you. And when, we, when Jesus truly is the center of it all, you know, we sing that song, Jesus at the center of it all. <laughs> okay? It, is he? <laughs> As, uh, you know, I'm not for religious forms. I'm not for, you know what? <laughs> I'll close up shop and leave if, if things become like that. I, I, I could care less. I don't need to, you, you know, I need to be faithful with what God wants done. That's, that's what I need to do. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I hope you're here as well, so that together we can do what God wants done in Joburg and beyond and in the world and, and all of that. We're pioneering. We're setting up something that I haven't seen, really. Um, 
you know, I've heard, I hear, and, and we try. But God wants all that hearing and truth. That goes, he, 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 he wants to us to embody it. He wants to plant something here that is going to powerfully manifest himself. That is going to set up things that's going to be connected at grassroots level. That is going to set up practical things and pro that is going to embody God and his will and his intentions and his goodness and everything else. So it is, all right, it is about the embodiment. This is the door through which we enter into the kingdom of God because that's who Jesus represents. Jesus said, I am the door, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. When we enter into Christ, we are entering into the nature of God, which is not about our self-centered universe. We're entering into his heart, which is all about, of course he cares for us. But if we focus on the flesh and, and self, we won't have the right paradigm to be able to live that out where we're actually helping others. So, because when we are living in helping others and doing what God in, desires to be done with others, then automatically God takes care of us. And we don't need to anymore worry and fret and fume about our own things. Do an experiment. <laughs> Do an experiment. Purpose in your heart to make Jesus King, Lord of all in your life and walk with him and do what he says to do and, just, and you see what miracles God will do in your own life without you even chasing after them. Jesus said, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out devils, they will lay hands on the sick, they will recover, etc., etc. These signs follow us. We're not meant to be chasing after them. We are meant to be embodying God, walking with God, and these things will follow us. Of course God is faithful and he will take care of his own. But we need to make him our heart's desire. He needs to be king. He needs to be... What, what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? It means he's number one. Number one. Not included in our... When we have time. <laughs> that's, that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like, as we spoke about last week, the... the, the um, uh, leaven, the, the yeast in the dough that takes over everything. You can't contain the kingdom of God. If you truly have, if we truly have the kingdom of God and that proper understanding, that kingdom of God and the wine skin that is totally for God, Lord, you can expand me any way you want, you can lead, He will permeate every fiber of our being and life, practically, spiritually, emotionally, whatever you want to, whatever facet of life you can think of, he will take over. And it's not, a, it's not like the devil. The devil forcibly comes in, kicks down things over and takes over in a bad way. God is a gentleman. He stands at the door, Revelation 3.20, and knocks. He says, do you want me to come in? But this is what that means. It means... I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. You'll have no other gods before me. Only in fully giving ourselves to truth can we ever understand the truth. If we just stick a little pinky in, we can't fully understand. Maybe your pinky will understand, if I can say like that, but I don't think so. But, you know, to, to fully experience swimming, you don't stick your little toe in and go like that. And, oh, that's what swimming is like. You don't know what swimming is like. You're not swimming. You're sticking a little pinky in the water and, and, and saying, I know, that's truth. Yeah, that swimming pool, that's truth. And my little pinky, I'm swirling the water around and I'm affecting. Look, I'm, I'm even making a little pool of water go like that. And yeah, you're affecting that little pool of water there. But God is saying, jump in. Don't just swirl your little toe in the, in the pool. Jesus is the pool, <laughs> okay? He's saying, don't, come on, please. I gave all of myself for you. Don't just give me your little pinky. Don't just swirl your little toe around. I want to swim with you. I want to live with you. I, wanna, I want you, because I love you so much, I want you to experience me. 
I want, to, I want you to experience all that I have for you. Man, you don't know what you're missing, God is saying. It's not a, he's not a taskmaster waiting to just make life miserable. There is no joy outside of him. Why do you want to be where there is no joy, thinking that I'm going to make myself happy, I create my paradigm, my life, self-centered world, and I, as long as I have everything, some of the richest people in the world end their lives. Because they find out their whole lives was revolved around that. They got everything they desired. And then at the end, they end their life because they realize those things can't make them happy. And they were still empty. And they were still like, so what was my whole life for? I just wasted my whole life. And they end it. They're just like totally, there's people all around us like that. We need to embody, we need to understand and live in the fullness of Christ. The world is waiting, and the kingdom of God, and to be effective for the kingdom of God, requires, requires, it's not an option. If we want to fully walk with God and manifest who He is, His kingdom, we have to jump all in. There is no alternative. And it's not, the enemy, try, again, tries to make it this big bad thing, oh, you're going to be miserable, he's going to take away. No, God loves us. <laughs> You see, and when we understand God loves us, then fear is removed. Because we will no longer think, oh, he's going to take something good away from my life and it's going to be like... No, we, we won't think like that if we love, if we understand God's love for us. He is love. He created our life. Okay, so... <clears throat> so in um, Mark 1, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus was preaching, the kingdom of God. God's kingdom is like this. And he would heal the sick, raise the dead. He would help people. He would enlighten them with truth, set them free in every way, shape, and form. That's what the kingdom of God is like. Jesus, his message was the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like this. And where is, where is the kingdom of God? What does it mean, the kingdom of God? It means where God is king. Is the kingdom of God within you? Uh, the scripture tells us, let a person examine himself and see if he is in the faith. Because if we have made Jesus Lord and King and Savior, then yes, we are part of the kingdom of God. Because God is king in our life. Is God king? in our life. Is He Lord of all? If we call ourselves a believer, is He Lord of all? Is God King in our life? Do we follow Him? Do we seek first His kingdom? That means that we are part of His kingdom. Where God is King, that's His kingdom. So, let a person examine himself to see if he's made that decision. Where God is King. Because then, if we have made that decision and opened our life to Jesus in that way, then we will be representatives of the kingdom of God because we're part of the kingdom of God. It's who we are. It's our identity. It's not something we're trying to do. I need to do things to manifest the kingdom of God. No. If we have opened our life to God, we are part of the kingdom of God and we will want to do what Jesus said to do. Because we will love God and we will want to do um, what His will is. And His will is to help people. So Jesus said, Mark 1, He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God <clears throat> is at hand. He, it's here. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news. So He said, the time is, is now. You're looking for truth. You're looking for the full manifest. It's now. The kingdom of God is here among us. So he said, basically what he's saying is, if you want to enter in an experience, this is what you need to do. Repent and believe in the gospel. What does it mean to repent? It's kind of a religious term for many now. And you don't, but it simply means to turn from our own ways. If, if we're walking this way and God is like, no, this is the way. So we, repent means to turn around, forsake walking our own way, and to walk God's way. That's what it means. It means to turn around and, and go another way. 
And so what Jesus was saying, he was saying, the kingdom of God is at hand, but if you want to enter in, and if you want to experience the kingdom of God, you want to embody, you want to jump in that pool, this is what you do. Repent, turn from a self-centered world, and walk with him, and believe in him. Believe that God is able. Believe that everything he's, that God said is actually, he is faithful to do. And act like you believe. <laughs> in other words, don't just say, yeah, I believe. Well, in James, James, yeah, he says, you, you believe, show me by what you live. Show me by what you do. Show me your faith. What is your faith translating into show me? What, practically, what, what is that? effect in the natural realm here. Who is being helped, healed, taken care of? What is changing as a result of your faith? So God is just letting us know that we need to make sure we don't become a bunch of religious people sitting here who know lots of true things, but we're not embodying them. We're not embodying who He is. To know God means to walk with God and do the things God wants to do. It doesn't mean to be able to say the right things. It means living, embodiment. This is where the action is. This is where the joy, the fullness of joy, this is where the fullness of every promise of God is fulfilled when we seek first His kingdom. The flesh says, that's hard. I don't want to go through that narrow way. I can't take all my stuff with me. <laughs> it's a, Jesus said, the way is narrow that leads to life. So the way is broad that leads to, to death. Everybody, you know, the, the majority of the world is on that broad way. But then Jesus said, okay, here is the way to life with God, life eternal. It's a narrow way, meaning you can't walk with all your stuff like that and go through the narrow passage. To, to, to enter into the kingdom of God in that relationship, God says, leave, leave all the rest behind. Leave it behind can't take it. You can't take it with you. You got to leave it behind. But we think, no, these things will make me happy. <laughs> I like these things. I want these things. You want me to have these things. You promise that I will have these things, God, right? The difference is when God, the difference is when we're seeking first God's kingdom, yes, he will give us he will make sure we have what we need. But if we make our life about chasing after those things, we're not walking on God's path. So we have to walk with God and have faith in Him that, yes, He will cause all these other things to be added unto us as well. Okay? Anything that we, we need. But if those things have a hold in our heart... We, we, won't, we won't be swimming in the pool. We won't be experiencing and manifesting the life of Christ. We won't be walking in the fullness and the baptism of the Holy Spirit because there's too much other stuff cluttering the space where God wants to move. I mean, there is no limit. I think it was Dwight L. Moody who said, there is no limit to what God can do with a person who is entirely... Um, I can't remember exactly what I said, but the point was this. <laughs> there is no limit to what God can do with a person who totally gives himself to him and is willing to uh, follow his will. Something like that. <laughs> there is no limit. It doesn't matter. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you've studied this or you haven't studied that. I don't care if you've done everything right or you've done everything wrong to this. I, I don't care. God doesn't care. He says, today, now, Right here, right now, you can make the decision to make Jesus king. To make God the one guiding star in your life through Jesus Christ. And when you do that, God, you become part of the kingdom of God. Not just in, in a word or in, in some kind of piece of information, but you become an embodiment. You be, God does it, not you, not me. God does it. When we make that decision, boom, we become part of the kingdom of God. And when somebody touches you, they're touching the kingdom of God.
When you touch somebody, the kingdom of God is touching somebody. And it's not about, oh, I need to try to have faith. I need No. No. You are the kingdom of God. Because God is king in you. You've made that choice. Where God is king, it's his kingdom. It's not about dead works of the flesh and trying to get things to happen. It is about understanding what God has accomplished inside of us when we made that choice to make Him king. God came in. He's here. He's with us. And there is nothing He can't do. We become. It's our identity. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about identity. We become part. We become His body. We become part of the kingdom of God. We need to understand this. And we need to understand, again, what comes with this. We become part of his kingdom so that his will can be enacted. The will of the king can be accomplished. And when truly his will becomes our will, there is nothing God can't do or won't do through somebody whose heart is given completely to him. He loves us so much. He's not stingy. <laughs> He's not withholding he doesn't run out of anything. <laughs> he doesn't run out of... It doesn't matter what you want to apply this to. God never runs out. He created everything. How can he run out of anything? You know what I'm saying? It's like God's intention for us. But you see, there is a clear line drawn in the sand. Like I was talking about before, the line in the sand is embodying and living as opposed to simply having information. You understand? In James it says, um, let us not be just a hearer deceiving ourselves, but let us be a doer, living the will of God. Jesus said right here, um, uh, where was that? I read there. Didn't get there yet. Um, Well, Jesus said, repent and believe the gospel. Let me read you something in Mark, something Jesus said. You remember the situation where Nicodemus, he was uh, uh, one of the... No, sorry, this isn't Nicodemus. Mark 12, one of the scribes came and heard them reasoning together. And perceiving that he had answered them well, he asked Jesus, what is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered the first of all the commandments is love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like that, saying you should love your neighbor as yourself. And so the scribe said to him, well, you answered well, teacher. You've spoken the truth. There's one God. There is no other but he. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your soul and with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as yourself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw his answer, that he answered wisely, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not there yet, but you're not far. He had, the scribe had this knowledge. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. There's no, that, that's what it's all about. It's not about all the sacrifices and offerings. And Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. The one thing that carries over somebody into the embodiment and partaking of the kingdom of God and being part of the kingdom of God. Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. Return from our own ways and make Jesus the center of it all. So we can truly sing that song, Jesus, you are the center of it all. And when we can really declare that from our heart, Jesus, you are the center of it all. I'm here to enact your will because you know best. You know, why would we limit our life experience to a limited understanding. And we can do this stuff right here in our limited understanding. Whereas God is able to do so much more and He has knowledge of, my goodness, every situation that's going on in the world. And so if we hope to allow God to have full sway so that we can live effectively and enact God's will the way he wants to, we have to get outside of our little paradigm, of our little self-centered universe where the sun and the moon and the stars, everything revolves around what we want to do. <laughs> and there it is right there. 
And God is like, come on, you don't know what you're missing. There is so much more. There is so much more in regards to the meaning of life that you can help people, that you will experience yourself this, and then you will be a blessing to others in so many ways because God is going to pour in His Spirit, His new wine, into a new wine skin because we have chosen to allow God to expand us and take us anywhere He wants. And so then when His new wine of the Spirit comes in, we will flow with Him, we will grow with Him, and we will go and we will do, and then we will produce fruit. Jesus said in John 15, He said, I've chosen you and appointed you that you would bear fruit for the kingdom of God. He didn't choose us so that we can become so knowledgeable with information in our head. And we can die with that information in our head. <laughs> he said, I came that you will bear fruit. In other words, that you will use this knowledge of the truth and this relationship with me to embody all that I am. Okay. So Jesus told the scribe, you're not far from the kingdom of God. You know these things, great. Now open your heart. Repent, turn, and believe and walk with me. That is Remember the rich young ruler, he had so many things and he, he knew stuff. And Jesus said, one thing you lack, sell everything that you have <laughs> and follow me. <laughs> because those things were so much in his heart. The only possible way that he could make room for God was just to leave it all behind in his situation. And um, you see, God is not against us having things, He will bless us more than we could ever achieve on our own. It's God's will. It's His intention. But to take it to... Because in God's kingdom, there, there's enough. Okay? <laughs> God is not lacking anything. But we must enter fully in. Jump in that pool where He is king. So then when we have all these things, we, don't, we could care less. We could care less. But yet we have them and we'll use them for the kingdom of God. We will use them because God wants to take care of us. He wants to use us. But you know what? We're not going to get our eyes on those things. That's where God wants to bring us. But the problem is so many people chase after the things and, and they're not seeking first His kingdom. So we need to seek first His kingdom. What, not as a mean to get things, okay? Hear, hear what I'm saying, okay? So a lot of people say, yeah, okay, I'll seek first His kingdom because then I'm going to get those things. No. <laughs> you have not entered into the kingdom of God experientially if that's still the mindset. We're talking here about entering into and embodying the kingdom of God, the mind of Christ, the mind of God, and what it means to be a real Christian. Okay? So... Um, in Matthew seven twenty one, Jesus said, Not everyone, okay, we read that first part, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it's not enough to say, Yes, Lord, I love you, whatever. How do you prove to somebody you love them? Because your actions will manifest that, right? I love you, I love you, and then in time of need, oh, bye. <laughs> no, that's not love. God loves us, and He will not leave us in our time of need. But for a full relationship between two people, there must be a reciprocal relationship of love, right? Love is not a one-sided relationship, okay? Love takes two, <laughs> all right? And so when we, Jesus said, and He already did, He laid down His life for us, we love Him because He first loved us, Scripture tells us. So Jesus laid down His life, He gave it all, and so he's already like this. Now it's up to us to lay it all down if we want to fully enter in to whom he is and fully embody the kingdom of God. Okay, so many will say to me in that day, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We've done many miracles in your name. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So it's not about just the miracles. It's not about just any of these good things. I mean, we're all for all those things just listed there, you know, prophesying, casting out demons and miracles and all these things. But we don't let anything, even good things, be more important to us than our love and relationship with Him. 
the giving of that inner place of our heart to him alone, and no one or nothing else can ever take that place. Nothing. Doesn't matter what goes on, doesn't matter how many seemingly hard times or blessings we get flooded with. It won't matter because our heart is his and his alone and nothing else will be allowed into that secret place which is reserved for him alone. Only when we reach that um, uh, point of life in God, <laughs> say it like that, where he, is, he alone has that secret place of our heart, only then will we begin to understand and experience everything God has for us. We'll be on that track to growing up into him in all things, in all things, not just some things, in all areas, character, nature, effectiveness, authority, power, all of it, you know, because it's part of who he is. Okay, so Jesus said, I never knew you. All these people who did all these amazing things because they had faith that God could do that and God did it. God prophesied, God cast out, God, um, you know, healed, did miracles. But there's more, okay? There is walking with him in that secret place. That is what transformed Peter to stand up before the thousands when before he was so afraid and he denied Jesus three times and he just, and the Holy Spirit came in and just totally filled every area and he became part of the kingdom of God because when the Spirit was given, the power of the Spirit was given and that's the era that we live in where the power of the, the Spirit of God, he's right here waiting to fill every part that we give to him. Okay, We're not living in the time when we're begging God, please come. No, He's come. His Spirit is available. He went to the cross. He went to the Father. And so now, the Holy Spirit, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking, th um, who, looking for whose heart is completely given to Him so that He can strongly support Him. It says in um, Second Chronicles somewhere over there. That's what it says. So the Spirit of God is right here. Right now. He's not far away. The kingdom of God is at hand. Right here. All that you can imagine God is able to do and you want him to do it, he's right here. He's, he's not hiding. He's not hiding somewhere around the corner and you have to play hide and go seek. <laughs> he's right here. He said, repent and believe. Turn from your own ways. Believe in my word and I will meet you right here, right now in that secret place of your heart that you've given to me, I will meet you there and you will, uh, maybe, you will experience all that I am because you've given your heart completely to me. You're holding nothing back, therefore I will hold nothing back from you. You who have given all, I will give you all. This is what Jesus was saying when he said, I never knew you to some people who were walking in power. They had faith toward God in a certain way. But Jesus said, I never knew you. That secret place is where we know God. That secret place that dictates our life, the direction where we go. Give that to God. And then he will answer your questions. He will be your all in all, everything that... All that he is will be your experience. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to get through everything that I wanted to get through today. In um, 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, it says, You therefore endure hardship. Paul was speaking to Timothy uh, people were giving Timothy a hard time because he was a young man and there were some people older, uh, whatever, and, and they, looked, they despised Timothy's youth and said, uh, even though the Apostle Paul put him there. So they were giving him a hard time. Anyway, Paul was saying to him, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare. Okay, are you engaged in warfare? If you're following Jesus, you are engaged in warfare. You are advancing against the kingdom of Satan. You are freeing people from his grip and his clutches. Every time you heal the sick, you are freeing somebody from 
the devil's will, which is to steal, kill, and destroy, and you are bringing them into the life of God and his experience. Every time you tell somebody about Jesus who has this religious conception, Jesus, now that's for religious people, and you say, no, it's not like that. Let me, let me tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like, and let me show you what the kingdom of heaven is like, and they get enlightened. Every time you do that and somebody comes to God, you are, um, it's spiritual warfare. The demons around, they don't want that to happen, but you are going forward in faith and the authority and love of Christ to bring light. Okay, so no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. It's a matter of focus. It's not saying disconnect yourself, go live on a mountain and, you know, just be like, you know, don't interact with people. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying you can walk through the center of a busy street and you can be interacting with people, but in your heart, you're communing with Jesus. You're walking with him. And so everything you do is going to be filled with his knowledge, wisdom, power, anointing and spirit to do it the way God wants it done. And it's going to be much better than if you tried by yourself <laughs> in the flesh. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about living a solitary life. We're talking about walking with God through life. Okay. Um, so no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. See, the only way to please God and walk with God is to walk unentangled. It's to, walk, to live a life where he's king. We're part of his kingdom. He's king. We've made that decision. Okay, so he's our focus. If anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned. Okay, think like the Olympics. Somebody competing in a competition. He's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. If you're running a marathon, what's the name of a marathon? Albert, you know, what, okay, what's a popular marathon around here? Or triathlon or whatever. Comrades, okay, no idea. Comrades, okay. Comrades. What is it, a triathlon or, or, or a marathon? Marathon. Marathon, running. Running. Just running. Okay. So if you're running the comrades and you take a shortcut, <laughs> you can't cut through the, I don't know where you go, but you can't cut through where you're not supposed to go and still... Uh, you know, expect to receive the, the, the first gold. What do they do? Gold. Some have tried. Okay, some have tried. Yeah, and, the, and well, with God, okay, he, <laughs> he sees all. He may be able to pull one over on some local judges. They don't see all. But, so, but if, if somebody's not competing according to the rules, they're not going to get the prize. Simple as that. You, it doesn't work like that. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Cons uh, I don't know. All right, the point is this. What does that mean, to compete according to the rules? Well, remember just up um, in Matthew 7, where Jesus said people were doing all these things. They were competing. But he said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They weren't competing according to the rules. They were doing things, good things. They were allowing God. They had faith toward God in certain areas, and they were affecting people. They were doing good things. But Jesus said, I never knew you. you don't, you're operating in lawlessness. There's no law of the Spirit guiding you. You're not walking in relationship with me. That inner place of your heart is still yours. You, you haven't given to me so we could never be enjoined in that type of intimate relationship. So now, that's why Jesus said, I never knew you. So we can compete and we can, I mean, compete. We can do good things with God, for God. But we need to compete according to the rules. Because it, it's talking about receiving a prize here. Okay, This is in the context of receiving a reward, a prize, where Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. If we want Jesus to say that of us, that means there is reward for what we have done on this earth. And yeah, we don't do it for rewards, but Jesus is letting us know there is. There is rewards, okay? He said, my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. That's what it says in the last chapter, chapter of Revelation. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. That's how he ends the Bible. You know, right there towards the end. He wants, he wants us to know. I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to every person according to what he has done. According as his work shall be. 
So we've got to compete according to the rules. In other words, for the glory of God alone. If we are doing things for, because somehow uh, we're going to, if we are still the center of our life, then what we do is, is not bringing God glory. It may do some good things and it may help, but we won't get credit for it. Because God opened the door for every good thing to happen. And he needs to be the center of it all. And so um, a person who is living the Christian life according to the rules, that rule is that Jesus is king. <laughs> And what we do, we do for his glory. And in that reality, we find that all that God is, is made available to us. Because we're holding nothing back from him. Even that will, that sovereign will that he has given us, we give it to him. And when we do that, God says, okay, you're, 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 you've entered in. Now, there is a flow. There is a, a joining of hearts and experience of life that we're going to share together. Because who could ever have accomplished that? I mean, who could ever elevate themselves to such a position with God? Nobody can do that. God had to reach down. Remember the two religions? He had to reach down and say, this is what I'm offering you. Total experience in life with me. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights. Love himself personified. That's who he is. All authority, all power is his. And he's reaching down and says, here, walk with me. I want you to experience all that I am. And so we've got to lay it down of our own centered universe so that we can enter in to all whom he is. That's competing according to the rules for his glory, for his glory alone, where Jesus truly is the center of it all. <clears throat> um, in Mark 4 we have the uh, the parable of the we'll end with this I think Mark 4 the parable of the sower and it says Jesus said Mark 4 verse 3 behold a sower, you know, somebody sowing seeds in the ground, planting seeds. A sower went out to sow, and it happened as he did this that some of the seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and ate them. Some fell on the stony ground, and it did not have much earth there. And so immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun came up, it was scorched in the sun because it had no root, and it withered away. Some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. I don't want to rush this, um, so I'm going to I'm going to pick up on this next time. I was always thinking, okay, four thirty, four thirty there. So be good soil. That's that's going to be the point. But I'll fill in some details next time. <laughs> Good soil means you're competing according to the rules, means you've given that, that place and G, where Jesus is king and we enter in. So yeah, it's totally forgot. Um, this is our second time meeting here, so I'm still getting used to the, <laughs> the time frames here. 2.30 to 4. All right. So Father, we thank you so much for um, making yourself totally and completely available to us. And we thank you that... You don't hold anything back. You don't hold any part of yourself back from us. You have made it possible for us to live life with you. And you just ask that we lay down our life as you laid down yours so that we can be enjoined to all whom you are and truly embody your kingdom and in relationship with you just live this life. And so we thank you, Jesus, that you first loved us enough to go and do that and lay down your life so that we could... Um, Walk and live life with you. I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know, if there's anybody here and you haven't made that uh, decision to make Jesus king and enter into this kind of relationship, you can do so just right now, just where you are to say, Jesus, I'm not going to live a self-centered life anymore. I'm going to make you king right now. I want you to be king and Lord. 
and I invite you into my life right now, and please fill me with your spirit. I turn from all the old stuff, and I just want to live and experience you now. I just want to live for your glory in your love so that I can not only experience you, but be a blessing to others. So, Father, we just, we just thank you for making yourself available and help us to live as full representatives of your kingdom. Not just in word, but in deed. In Jesus' name, amen.